Hi, it's Dennis Daly. Since the beginning of radio, there have been ham radio operators. They got their nickname because the professional telegraphers thought that their technique was a little sloppy, a little ham-handed. That was back when everything was in Morse code. For years, tens of thousands of ham radio operators have gotten together every year in Dayton, Ohio, for the annual Ham Fest. And you and I are going to one of them. Welcome to Hamvention 1996. See KB2TX for show specials and quality products. Hi, everybody. We're on the road again, this time in Dayton, Ohio. For some 30 years, I've been in broadcasting, and a lot of friends of mine are and were ham radio operators. They always said, you've got to go to Dayton in the springtime. It is the biggest assemblage of ham radio operators anywhere. Well, this week on American Montage, we are in Dayton for the annual Hamvention. It's been going on since the 1950s, and this year, some 35,000 people are here. What you're hearing in the background is an innovative way to learn code. It's being played on a cassette machine from the back of a pickup truck. A vendor is here. There are thousands of people here selling everything from new computer equipment to old-fashioned tubes and things you haven't seen for a very long time. That is some of the fun of going to Hamvention. Not only the new exhibits, but also seeing all the things for sale in the flea market. For $25 and the 1996. The first person I ran into was Armin Noble. He is a publisher, and like many people at the Ham Fest, he was very quick to tell me not only his name, but his FCC call sign. My call is N6WR, and people just call me Armin. Armin, where are you headquartered? Sacramento, California. How many years have you been going to the um, Hamvention here? Uh, we've been here about 10 consecutive years. You know, I grew up in southern Indiana, not too far from here, and had wanted for decades to come here. I mean, this has been going on since, I think, the 50s. Oh, oh yes. And, and, and I had to finally go out on assignment to do it. What does this mean to the ham radio operator? Not, well, I want to get into what it means to the vendors, but to the people who are here, there seems to be a great sense of camaraderie. Oh, uh, that probably is one of the most interesting facets of amateur radio is the uh, way they all feel about each other. It's kind of like soldiers and policemen, a shared experience. They know they've all had to go and take the tests necessary to get a license. And so there is a, a, a great kinship amongst amateurs. Can we define for those who have heard the phrase ham radio or amateur radio just what it is? The first thing I want to put in is that it's not like CB, where everybody and his brother can jump on with any kind of equipment and violate every rule in the book. It, it takes some degree of knowledge and discipline. Absolutely. And, and uh, amateurs... Uh, kind of take great umbrage if someone sees an antenna on their car and says, uh, what channel are you on? <laughs> yes, the, uh, the various tests are uh, somewhat difficult, but, but not impossible. Uh, there are some 700,000 active or amateurs in the United States today that have managed to pass this test, these tests. Uh, approximately half of the amateurs are employed in some technical uh, employment, but the other half are as big a cross-section of occupation and education and income as you could imagine. Well, here I am a couple of decades, hopefully, away from retiring. I've been in broadcasting for 30 years, and I'm beginning to think, because I'm one of those people who's married to my job with no real hobby, that this would be the sensible thing for me to get into as I head toward retirement. Well, that's true. Uh, particularly, um, while there are you know, many young amateurs, a thing of it is, for the older, let's say when in another 50 years, uh, when you can't play tennis or golf or anything like that, you can sit home and here is an entire window on the world uh, in the international way and in the local with the various uh, repeaters on, you're in constant contact, not only for the fun, but the uh, emergency nature of it also. Something I've noticed too uh, that surprised me, but it really shouldn't, is that this group... Uh, 
uh, meeting here, the number of handicapped people, a uh, couple of uh, several blind people I've yes. talked to, uh, v d very very senior citizens. You talk about a cross section, but as far as affording a lot of people who are homebound a link with the outside world, this is absolutely perfect. In fact, there is a organization called Handy Hams, and made up of the handicapped, bedridden, wheelchair-driven, uh, housebound, uh, who the able-bodied support this organization. And as you could well imagine, some of them could not even leave their home. What what this offers now? Now they, you know, they can partake of other, you know, of activities. A publisher who is nationally known for his good work in amateur radio is Armin Noble. We've been talking to him about the wonderful world of radio, and I ask him how things have changed in the decades or so since he got his first license. I was first licensed in 1958, and I was interested in it far earlier than that. I think the biggest change, like you say, in, besides the equipment, you know, getting much smaller and much lighter, consuming less power and costing much less, is that many years ago, amateur radio was made up of, of highly technical people, and that was the sum and total of it. Today, uh, much more the emphasis is on emergency communications, uh, public service, you know, furnishing the communications for the various walks or runs for charities. And uh, that entire facet uh, is, is, is taking the place of the intense technical orientation. The, in, in California, where I'm from, the uh, Rose Bowl Parade is monitored by the amateur television group. Hmm. Now tell us about World Radio, the company you're with. You're, you're where in California? We're in uh, Sacramento. And uh, World Radio is a monthly magazine about amateur radio. And we've been publishing monthly monthly for uh, 25 years. Well, Armin, thanks for taking the time to talk. Uh, it took me decades to finally get here. wish it were a little cooler today, but uh, it's a heck of a convention. It's, uh, it is a bit warm. Well, this is like the elephant cage. You know, you get 30,000 people going. And uh, any of your uh, listeners that would like a totally free copy of World Radio, and we're very non-technical, very little jargon. Good place to start, then. And, and it would help them understand all the facets if you just call every Area code 916-457-3655. One is yours totally free. Armin, thank you. My pleasure. Double A Alkaline, $24 for $10. Auto Headdress Pillows, two for $5. Rapid charge this week on American Montage, we are among some 35,000 people attending the annual Hamvention, the biggest assemblage of amateur radio operators in the U.S., and it happens every spring in Dayton, Ohio. It is quite an undertaking for the local Dayton Ham Club to put all of this together. I walked around the display areas with Dick Miller, who is the number two man in charge this year. It started in 1952. It started at the uh, Biltmore Hotel downtown, and then we outgrew that and moved to Hare Arena here in um, 1964, I believe. And then from then on, it, it just grew until now we take the whole Hare complex. Now you are, before this is over, expecting about how many people here? Well, the way it looks, we're going to be around around 35,000. That's the number of tickets we sell. Uh, would that be a record? Uh, it'd be real close. It'd be real close to a record. And it's the first year we, for a couple of years we've had really nice weather and maybe that's because we moved it three weeks later into the year. Um, I know I went to a smaller ham fest in the Washington, D.C. area a couple of years ago. It was very early in the spring and the poor people got hit with an ice storm and it was just the worst possible thing. But of course any kind of event whether it's, uh, you know, the state fair or whatever, it's hard to plan in advance. There are so many things to see here, and, and in the time we have, we can't go through everything. But from the layman standpoint, particularly, let's say, a person who's heard about ham radio, amateur radio, what are the good things about going to what they call locally a ham fest or hear the hamvention? Well, if they're technically oriented, it's a very enlightening of the uh, newest developments in, uh, in not only amateur radio, but electronics in general. As far as their, the uh, people's interest in why why is there amateur radio, it's a public service organization. That's how it started out. Uh, we're standing right by 
inside this van here. We've it's been to many uh, really disasters from uh, and, and other public servicing floods, and, and we also do a lot of public service like uh, monitoring uh, runs, ri bicycle rides, walks for, for charities, and so forth. You know, the other day I was talking about emergency communications with a friend of mine, and he said, "Ah, oh, now that they've got cellular phone, they don't need ham radio." And I said, "Now wait a minute. If there's an earthquake in San Francisco and the lights go out, the the, the handheld cellular phone might work, but the system is down. You guys are all battery for the most part. I've seen generators here. There's really, I would say, no type of emergency in which you can't function. Uh, that's correct. I'd like to give two real fast instances. Uh, here in, in Miamisburg, which is a suburb of Dayton, uh, a few years ago, we had a, a train derailment, and there was a gas, volatile gas. Now, that, that involved the evacuation of a tremendous number of people, didn't it? That's true. And what, what the real problem was is the various uh, police and fire authorities got together, they found they couldn't talk to each other. They were on different frequencies. So they mobilized the amateurs. We're ready to go in an instant. And they, they put an amateur radio operator with all these different outfits, even in helicopters, so they could communicate. And more recently, uh, the Oklahoma City disaster uh, a year ago, the cellular phones are great, but they, they were all overloaded. They couldn't get anything. So we, we had a great part in, in the communications, emergency communications in Oklahoma City. Dick Miller has been showing us around. He is the number two man at this year's convention. And I continue my conversation with him. One of the things for the layman I think we might need to explain here is people who are familiar with CB radio, there's what, 36, 24, I forget how many channels there are, but 40. But 40. Uh, that, that shows how long ago I first got into, <laughs> into CB. But you're limited to those specific frequencies. Am I right in saying that a ham, based upon how far he or she proceeds and gets different types of licenses really have not an unlimited number of frequencies but a, a vast array of various different frequencies Th that's a whole different world from what we're talking about when we think only of CB radio. Uh, that's correct. Uh, a lot of times we're confused with CB. CB has its place but with amateur radio we can talk for over much longer distances. We talk through what are called repeaters which spread the, the message, for, I mean the signal for further. Uh, if you're on the uh, bands that you can talk across the world, actually, I mean, I've talked to people all around the world on, on what we refer to as low bands, which is HF frequencies. And that's uh, that, that's a real big difference, but you can talk to folks, uh, as I say, and we have people from all over the world here at this convention. You know, one of the things that's always intrigued me is how, and maybe it's because I'm so talkative verbally, <laughs> how we've entered the age of, of oral verbal communications, but the number of people who still love code, and it's not just the people who have been in ham forever. I mean, you see the equipment still here. I had a buddy in Indiana who, when he was in high school, was the national champion for what you call DXing, I guess, which is talking long distance, right. and had these postcards, these QSL cards, from every places like San Marino and Malta that he'd talked to. Tell us a little bit about, about that fascination with code. For some people, it's so very foreign. Well, I hate to say this, I'm, I'm not really hung up on code. I, I don't... I, code uh, I've never been a lover of, but I know several people, young and old, ex-Navy veterans and young folks, who really like it. It's like speaking a foreign language, and they just take to it, might say like a duck takes to water. Also, I've been told, too, it will cut through noisy channels, because you're not trying to decipher a voice. That's correct. You're not listening for a voice, you're listening for a sound. And a lot of times, in, in very bad uh, weather conditions, or bad uh, conditions, period, as far as the signal is concerned, it can be deciphered much easier than a voice. Dick, what does it feel like when you help out in time of disaster? I mean, I know that's a basic thing you guys do and you practice and you have mock alerts and all this kind of stuff. Although for many people, ham still seems to be a hobby rather than a service by their perception. But when you get involved with something or there's a tornado or some type of emergency and you know you've really provided a basic service, what does that feel like? Well, it's a tremendous feeling. You don't feel like a hero. You feel like, gee, my hobby is has paid off. I've done something with it. I've helped somebody else. And most hams are oriented that way. They're glad to help somebody else in, in a disaster. And we've done it all around the world. Not only the United States, but
in other countries, uh, like Mexico City earthquake a few years ago, the Granada War. A lot of these places, it's been uh, invaluable in getting communications around the world. Well, I know sitting in our newsroom in Washington, quite often we'll get a dispatch from the Philippines or wherever, and the first mention says a an amateur radio uh, uh, user is reporting that he has heard something has happened. And, and quite often, the first little leak of information we get is an intercepted ham transmission. Absolutely. That was particularly true in, in uh, the uh, the Granada thing, uh, Granada, however it's pronounced. Anyway, that was, it was the first few hours, there was no communication except amateur radio. All the communications came back, and even the military made use of that type of thing. But uh, it doesn't have to be a war. The uh, the Aniki uh, hurricane, not hurricane, but uh, typhoon that, that hit uh, out in uh, the Hawaiian Islands. For many days, that's what the main communications because it knocked everything out except amateur radio. Now, we are not that many miles from a little Dayton suburb that had one of the worst tornadoes to ever hit the Midwest, and that was the city of Xenia, spelt with an X. Were you around at that time? Yes, I was. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't an amateur radio operator at the time, but it was uh, the, the, a club was formed in Xenia uh, called x Warn, which I am now a member, and it was formed because of the service that was done to the community or provided to the community uh, by amateur radio operators just in an instant without any previous organization. And now we have great cooperation from the sheriff, the police, the hospital, and everything out in that area. Well, with all the sounds we've been using going in and out of the segments from the flea market, I don't want to give you the impression that the hamvention in Dayton, Ohio, is all just a swap meet, although that is much of it. Some 35,000 people gathering this year to get together, to meet each other, to just reinforce in their own mind just how important to themselves and to the community and the nation ham radio, amateur radio, actually is. Our host in this segment is Dick Miller, the number two man at this year's Hamvention. He's been showing us around, and one of the things I mentioned to him is that I didn't know which was more fun, the displays of new equipment inside or the flea market outside. Well, they're both fun, and a lot of people prefer one over the other, but also an awful lot of folks like to hit the flea market earlier in the morning, then as it, then as it gets warm, come inside, and, or vice versa, uh, come inside when it's not as busy, then go out of the flea market in the afternoon. The flea market it's been said if you can't find it at Dayton, you probably don't need it or you can't find it anywhere. You know, it is so neat to see people who, and I guess we're all like that, who have their own little area of interest. I mean, there's a, a guy and his wife out there who are selling nothing but wiring. And and you'll, you'll go by somebody else and they have nothing but connectors for, for cables. And someone else is into only hard drives for computers. But that's the neat thing about it. And the thing I found is that whether it be here or some of the other ham fest, you find people who are so immersed in that, they are the expert when it comes to connectors, or the expert when it comes to wiring. Well, absolutely. The diversity of parts and things that you can find in the flea market really mirrors in the fact that amateur radio is so very diversified. Uh, it's not just code, or it's not just talking uh, to your friends around the world. There is uh, digital things, there, there is uh, satellite communication through the satellites, through moon bounce, uh, there is um, all kinds of uh, different types and this is why even TV why it's why it's such a diverse hobby you know somebody once told me and I, I am reminded of that because we're going by an exhibit here that's got a lot of you see antennas or antennae every place around here and I wondered if you could monitor all the frequencies just how much talking is going on through the airwaves at this convention somebody told me one time the the favorite phrase for outdoor antennas is if it didn't blow down last winter it's not big enough <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it it really is uh, the, uh, there are a lot of different types of antennas. The ones we're standing by here are ones that are used for mobile, and uh, they are all banned. And so you can you can talk literally around the world on antennas like this. There are other ones that are primarily used for local communication with maybe a 50-mile radius. Let me talk to this gentleman for a second, if I can. Uh, this is uh, Arnold Hopper, and you're you're with a company called Albacker Antennas. The thing that attracted me is you have a back Backpack, one of those aluminum frame backpacks that looks as if you're ready to go just about any. Can you tell me what all you got attached to this? 
running an ICOM 706. Which, which is, a, you better explain it for the layman. Okay, it's an HF transceiver. Also a uh, 50 megacycle transceiver and a VHF transceiver in the 144 band. Also running the Outbacker Perth Plus uh, antenna. Now, now tell me a little bit. This antenna is about three feet tall, and I don't know how to describe it for radio. It's got lumps all over it. <laughs> it's tunable taps that to change frequencies, you just move your antenna lead and retune it. Very simple. Quick and easy changing channels. I would assume that when you're dealing with various different frequencies, you get better reception than when the antenna is is matched to that frequency. To For what, what would you call it? Resonance purposes. Resonance. Right. That's correct. So I guess, and there's a I'm sure a battery pack here. Yeah, we're running about a nine amp hour battery gel cell in it. So if you went out in the outback with this, there's hardly, you could probably talk around the world from the nearest sand dune. These already made contacts from the parking lot out here to Puerto Rico, around other places. Uh, Andy here was the one. Was, uh, now Arnold, your company is based where? Uh, Outbacker Antennas is based here in, Chattan in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's imported, the antennas are imported from Australia. They have been used in the Outback for many how, years. How important is it, and I won't hold you up here forever, but how important is it for a vendor such as yourself to get the exposure uh, with all of these people coming in? It's very important. Uh, Dayton is, is one of the mainstays of Outbacker Antennas. And, well, thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Well, now, Dick, that's a good example of, of someone who I'm sure they advertise in ham radio magazines. Oh, yeah. But there's certainly nothing like seeing that antenna in person. It's a hands-on thing. Folks like to come in and get, look at the antenna, put their hands on it, see how, exactly how it works. As the gentleman was explaining, if you can see it, uh, like he was explaining to us, it, it, it's a lot better than just saying, oh, gee, it does this or does that. When I hear something else, and I'm seeing it almost every place I go, how computers have not only revolutionized uh, the way we live, but there is so much computer equipment here. Would you say that would be maybe the biggest change in hardware that you've seen in the years you've been in ham radio? Well, it's one of the biggest. The other thing is the miniature uh, radios that are by the space program has made a lot of the miniaturization of uh, components, so it makes it much easier to make a radio and uh, that you can carry around on your back like the gentleman was talking about. Dick Miller is the number two man in charge at this year's Hamvention. We've been talking about a variety of things as we have been walking around the big hall at the Hera Arena just north of Dayton, Ohio. I mentioned to Dick when he said that electronic equipment was getting smaller, that I can remember a time that if you had a two-way radio in your car, you had a unit in your trunk as big as a case of beer and a control unit half that big under the dash. Today's cars are too small for that. No, there's no way you could put the old equipment in it. Uh, the tube types are, are not used for mobile anymore, at least not very often. The uh, the new radios you can put in there, like the gentleman was talking, you can put that same radio in a car and still talk around the world with it. Or you can talk through what we call repeaters in an area like this, and that's very, very popular today. Earlier on, I was talking to a gentleman about the, the diversity of people who are into amateur radio. It's great for, he got into the fact that there there's a, a handicapped group, uh, many of whom uh, couldn't come here because they're home Bound, but yet they're in touch with the world. I'm impressed by the number of young kids I see here. Uh, that's very true. In fact, one little uh, personal instance, uh, I have a son-in-law who teaches fourth grade, and he, after school, he teaches a fourth grade, I mean, a class on amateur radio for the fourth graders. And he's had, he's been doing this about a year and a half, almost two years, and he's had uh, six or seven go on and get a license. But as part of his uh, teaching he, and his communication skills, he has what, we, what he calls adopt hams that talk to these kids once a week and get them used to talking to adults. If you don't see the adult, they don't know it's an adult, and you can just see these kids come out of their shell. So here's another use for amateur radio in teaching. You know, that brings up an interesting point, and I don't want to digress here too much, but I was talking to uh, a group of, uh, of uh, high school students on the subway in Washington, D.C., and one of them said to me in the middle of the conversation, he said, you know, adults don't talk to us unless they're mad at us. 
And I thought, my Lord, have we gotten... I was lucky growing up that I was in so many groups and we had teacher sponsors and we were always talking to adults. That's a very interesting concept, that you, you have to bridge a gap that I guess is growing larger. Uh, that's true, and this, this is not a unique situation. There are a couple of schools in New York City, one right in the heart of New York, that uses amateur radio to bring these kids to, to learn something they don't want to learn, but here's fun. They can, they can, you might say, play with the radios. They can talk, and they can, uh, they can learn from that. Dick, when did you start as a ham? I uh, got my first license in 1978. And at that time, how limited was that first license you got? Tell me uh, your progression, if you will. Well, my first license was a novice license, which provided only code privileges on a, on a narrow portion of the band. And then I went to a technician license, which uh, increases the what you can use. And you can use voice on what we call two meters. It's on HF band, or a uh, VHF band. And uh, then I went from that to a general class and now advanced. And that, that just simply, it simply means you have more privileges the higher your class you go. One of the things I've heard discussions about that I, I want to clear up for myself and for people listening to this program is what you call, I believe, networks. Am I right in saying that at specific times of day, people will, will kind of like a party line assemble on a specific frequency? How does that work? Absolutely. Well, it's usually they pick a frequency, a predetermined frequency, and there will be someone who directs the net. And that, that's just a net control as it's called. And various people check in and then they, they get the check-ins and they do a round table and see who has anything to say. And it isn't just a local net, all the way the local nets on, on um, repeaters are very popular, but there's a um, uh, net here in Dayton. It's called a Dayton net for folks who go to Florida in the wintertime. They can contact back here. And it meets at the same time every day. That's, that's absolutely neat. Uh, what about that uh, that long distance kind of thing? You've used the word repeater several times. Uh, I I know what a repeater does, but can you explain it for the layman? Okay, it's a station that that is usually up high and a receiving antenna. Uh, you can transmit from let's say here to the repeater, then that rebroadcasts it, increases your and increases your range, probably from about uh, 15 or 20 miles to 60 miles or better, or better, depending on the repeater. And sometimes a link repeater repeaters together, and from Dayton here, there's one repeater you can talk on it clear down into Tennessee, which is a long ways away. This would be a real essential for a person who had a low-powered handheld radio, would it not? Absolutely, and uh, there'll be a time when you'll be able to talk through satellites on handhelds, and when the new Oscar satellite goes up, the Phase 3D, which should be go up in the fall, uh, you'll be able to talk to it on some frequencies with a handheld. Dick, a couple of quick things. Sure. What's it like to talk to somebody long distance? and then finally meet them? Well, that's that's usually a thrill. It has been for me. You'll talk to someone, and that's one great thing about Dayton. Your people come here, we have what we call an eyeball contact. You may have talked to them in Germany or, or even Russia or South America, and pretty soon here you see that call and say, my goodness, there he is, and you, or there she is. There are a lot of women in the amateur radio now. And this this is really an exciting thing to, to actually see the person and meet them, just like an old friend. Now, you have a high uh, population of military here with right Patterson and some of the other the other bases. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those men and women into a lot of them are technically minded into ham radio. Yes, a lot of them are into amateur radio. Uh, of course, there's the military uh, uh, phase of this. But for what we're talking about here, a lot of folks get into that so they can contact back home, talk to mom, dad, or whatever, and they'll even do it overseas sometimes. They'll have, they'll have a permit to operate in a foreign country and they can talk back to their family here. Now, the one thing I guess I have to mention here is a, a long-standing group. I think they're headquartered in Connecticut. And let me get the initials right. A-R-R-L is it? The American Radio Relay League. Right. Can you tell us how important that is to ham radio and how it functions? Well, I, I, I wouldn't want to call it a lobby, but it's a gathering point. Uh, they do a lot of work with youth, as I mentioned before. Uh, they also do um, an organizational thing. It keeps us together. Uh, it's, it's not a union. It's, it's not a, a lobbyist. But it's... 
it, 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 they do a lot of work with helping amateur radio with the laws and so forth. So it's, it's a tremendous help. If someone's listening to this who really has no contact with anyone in ham radio, although I remember doing a show about a year ago and the fellow said just call your local radio station or TV station because probably one of the engineers is, is going to be in ham. How's the sensible way to begin finding out what this whole world is about and, and seeing if you want to join up? Well, one thing you can do is to go to a, a bookstore or a magazine stand and, and look at the amateur radio section there. Several very good magazines out and then contact ARRL and they have a lot of educational material but there are a lot of other places that have good educational material also and the thing to do is start to even go to the public library and see what they have and then contact them then find a, a ham in the area and uh, maybe through the local radio station I know one of the local television stations here has 14 hams on their staff so. <laughs> wow but there may be other ones that are the same way uh, and I think you can find there someone or if you're driving by and see a, a great big antenna sticking up in a tower in their backyard with an antenna on it, uh, stop and just politely knock on the door and ask them. I've, I had, I've had people do that to me when I've been out working in the yard with my antenna. They stop and talk to me about amateur radio. But it's a very good way to do it. I have to tell you a quick story. I was in my ham shack one day and she came in and said, what am I going to do with all this stuff if you die? I said, you have two choices. You can either sell it all as junk when, or you can join us. And she said, I think I'll join you. So she's a ham now. Both of our daughters are hams, both son-in-laws and one granddaughter. <laughs> well, Dick Miller, you do great work. I'm glad I finally got to Dayton. It, it is one heck of a show, and I think I'm going to hit the flea market before everything's sold out. Well, if everything's sold out, it would be a unique situation. But, yes, Dayton is almost like Mecca for, for, for amateur radio operators. They, they come here, and they, they love it. They come back year after year after year. Dick, thanks a lot. Thank you. A trip to the annual Hamvention going on at the Hera Convention Center in Dayton, Ohio. I'm Dennis Daly.